Okay. Um, the corporatocracy is this group of individuals, men mostly, a few women, who run our biggest corporations. And they really act as the emperor of this empire. Um, they control uh, our media, either through direct ownership or advertising. They control most of our uh, politicians because they finance their campaigns, either through their corporations or through personal contributions that come out of the corporations. And uh, they're not elected. They don't serve a limited term. They don't report to anybody. Uh, they really very, very much are running things. And they work under the premise that they should maximize profits regardless of the environmental and social costs. Would you mention that governments and corporations uh, and how the, the private enterprise is essentially... Right. And actually, in, in, Good point. In, coupled with that, could you mention how the government essentially is invisible when it comes to the actions of the corporatocracy. Right. It's, it's, they put the front group of the uh, unregulated private corporations. Yeah, at the very... One at the, so maybe they can make a small adjustment. Okay, go ahead. At the very top of the corporatocracy, you really can't tell whether a person's working for a private corporation or the government because they're always moving back and forth. So, you know, you've got a guy who one moment is the president of, uh, of a big construction company like Halliburton, and, and the next moment he's he's vice president of the United States, or the president who was in the oil business. And, and this is true whether you've got Democrats or Republicans in the office. You have the moving back and forth through the revolving door. So, you, you know, you really can't distinguish. And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time, and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government, they become government policy. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship and a very dangerous relationship. I think that's, that's part of what, as we move forward and we move out of this empire and we look for solutions, how do we create a better world for our children and grandchildren? One of the most important things is to break that, that, that bond there and to make people responsible more to just creating a decent world, creating a, an environmentally sustainable, socially just and peaceful world. It's interesting because the big corporations depend so much on the banking system, the whole financial system, the whole Wall Street system and, 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 and the banks. On the other hand, the banks depend on the corporations to make their money. So with the money that they have, they've got to invest it someplace. So they've got to invest it primarily in corporations. Um, and so there's this, there's this symbiotic relationship between them that, that, that exists. You, you couldn't have the huge corporate structures that we have without the banking structure that we have, and you couldn't have the banking structure that we have without the corporate structure that we have. And once again, it's, it's that corporatocracy. And you've got the people moving back and forth between these things, working with each other. So the big corporations almost always have financial people on their boards, and the big financial institutions almost always have corporate people on their boards. And there's this interweaving and intermeshing at the very, very top. And then all of them, at one point or another, probably work for the government or with the government. And the government people come into the banking system or the corporate system when they retire from government. And then maybe they go back again at some point in time. So it's a very insidious and, and I'd have to say a corrupt system. A system that just feeds into the hands of what we call the corporatocracy. And to a large degree works against everybody else in the world. Um, well, we economic hitmen really have been the ones responsible for creating this first truly global empire. And we work many different ways. Um, but perhaps the most common is that we will identify a, a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then uh, arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations but really don't help the majority of the people at all who are too poor to use much electricity or the ports or don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. It's such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan, that they can't repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, 
can't pay your debts, so sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Uh, allow us to build a military base in your country or uh, send troops in support of ours to someplace in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote. And in that way, we've really created an empire, but we've done it very, very subtly. It's clandestine. So all the empires of the past were built on the military, and everybody knew they were building them. So the, the British knew they were building them, the French, the Germans, the, the Romans, the, the Greeks. And they were proud of it. And they always had some excuse like spreading civilization, spreading some religion, something like that. But they, they knew they were doing it. We don't. The majority of the people in the United States have no idea that we're living off the benefits of a clandestine empire. That today there's as much slavery in the world, more slavery in the world, than ever before. That our shirts, our shoes, everything we own is made under the guise of this empire and that there's a tremendous amount of people around the planet suffering as a result of this. We are less than 5% of the world's population living in the United States. We're consuming more than 25% of the world's resources. That's a tragedy. Poor Noriega, we got that one. So, Arbenz, what happened with Arbenz? When Arbenz became president of Guatemala, the country was very much under the thumbs of United Fruit Company, the, the big international corporations. And Arbenz ran on the sticker that says, you know, we want to get the land back to the people. And once he took power, he was, he was implementing policies that would, that would do exactly that, give land rights back to the people. United Fruit didn't like that very much. And so they hired a public relations firm, launched a huge campaign in the United States to convince the United States people, the citizens of the United States, and the press of the United States, and the Congress of the United States, that Arbenz was a so Soviet puppet. And that if we allowed him to stay in power, the Soviets would have a foothold in this, uh, in this hemisphere. And, and that, at, at, at that point in time, was a huge fear on everybody's mind. We all, the, the, you know, the red terror, the communist terror. And so, to make a long story short, out of this public relations campaign came a commitment on the part of the CIA and the military to take this man out. And in fact, we did. We sent in planes, we sent in, we sent in soldiers, we sent in jackals, we sent everything in to take him out, and did take him out. And as soon as he was removed from office, the, 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 the new guy that took over after him basically reinstated everything to the big international corporations, including United Fruit. So, move on to Roldos. What happened? Ecuador, for many, many years, had been ruled by pro-U.S. dictators, often relatively brutal. They, 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 they often claimed to be democratic, but they weren't. They were dictators. And then it was decided that they were going to have a truly democratic election. Jaime Roldos ran for office. He was a young, dynamic uh, lawyer, and his main uh, goal, he said, as, as president, would be to help Ecuador use its resources, particularly its oil, to pull its poor people up by their own bootstraps, to make sure that Ecuador's resources were used to help the people. And he won, overwhelming, by more votes than anybody that ever won anything in Ecuador. And again, first democratically elected president after many years of, of essentially dictators. And he began to implement these policies to uh, in fact do that, to make sure that the oil companies were taxed, or if not, to be nationalized, to make sure that the profits from oil went to help the people. Well, we didn't like that in the United States. I was sent down as one of several economic hitmen, and in that particular job I wasn't the primary one. I was going to send in from Panama to help some of the other ones to change Roldos, to corrupt him, to bring him around, to let him know, you know, okay, you know, you can get very rich, you and your family, if you if you play our game, but if you, just, if you continue to try to keep these policies you've promised, uh, you, you're going to go. He wouldn't listen. Uh, he knew that his life was in severe danger. Uh, I've become good friends with his daughter in recent years. She's now in her 40s and a member of, uh, of the Congress in, in Quito, in Ecuador. And she said her dad was, was very aware that he was taking huge risks, but he took them anyway, and he was assassinated. And the means of assassination was? Uh, he, he, his airplane, officially his airplane crashed. He and his wife were on board and several other men uh, and uh, women. And the, the defense minister and his wife. 
And the pilot of that plane, according to Mark de Roldos, Jaime's, Jaime's daughter, was a very good f family friend, wouldn't have done anything foolish. She says that the official reports, which claim that the weather was very bad and they hit a high mountain, are erroneous. The weather wasn't that bad where they were, uh, by the standards of Ecuador. It was raining, but it rains a lot in the coastal plain. And they weren't even in the high mountains. They were coming up in, in the coastal area, according to, to Marta. Also, what we do know is that as soon as the plane crashed, the whole area was cordoned off. And nobody was allowed in. Even the local police, the Ecuadorian police, were not allowed in. The only people allowed in were U.S. military from a, from a nearby base and some of the Ecuadorian military that worked closely with the Ecuadorian military. When an investigation was launched, two of the key witnesses uh, died in car accidents before they had a, t a chance to testify. A lot of very, very strange things that went on around the, the assassination of Jaime Roldos. I, like most... People who've really looked at this case have absolutely no doubt that it was an assassination. And of course, in my position as an economic hitman, I was always expecting something to happen to Jaime, whether it be a coup or assassination, I wasn't sure, but that he would be taken down because he was not being corrupted. He would not allow himself to be corrupted the way we wanted to corrupt him. So now, airplane crashes are a great way to assassinate people because the evidence is destroyed and it's virtually impossible to prove yeah. foul play. So let's move on to uh, Allende, is that the pronunciation? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Allende again, president of Chile, and um, Allende went up against a very powerful U.S. corporation, ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph Company, and a guy named Harold Janine, who was a very powerful figure at the time. Um, and Janine decided that Allende had to go, brought in the CIA, the CIA went in and took him out. Now Allende was relatively easier to justify than some of the others because he was an avowed socialist, if you want to call it that, but he was doing really good things for his people. However, uh, ITT was totally opposed to him and the policies that he was implementing there. It's an interesting case too because if we look today at ITT, we don't find much. It still exists, but it's a very small company, the shadow of what it used to be. And yet at one time it had been one of the most powerful companies in the world, a company that was able to bring down the presidency of Allende in Chile. And, and I think that again sends this tremendously strong message to us that these corporations are vulnerable and that we do have clout, we the people, because it and is gone. Many other big corporations that move around during most of my lifetime are gone now too. You look at look at the airline industry. Look at Pan American, which was a very very powerful company at one time, owned Interco Intercontinental Hotels and many other businesses. Gone today. This this so much of that out there of companies that have disappeared. And the people who run these companies are very very aware of that. That gives us a lot of leverage. We the people can exercise power of these companies and force them to do a better job. So Torrios, was described in the same kind of brief capacity what happened to him and, and denote the plane crash as well as mm. his connections. Omar Torrijos, president of Panama, was you know one of my favorite people. I really, really liked him. He was very charismatic. He was a guy who really wanted to help his country. And when I tried to bribe him or corrupt him, he said, look, John, he called me Juanito. He said, look, Juanito, um, I don't need the money. You know, I got a good life, I got a good house, I got a good wife, I got whatever I want in terms of yachts. And, and he was a, you know, guy who really liked his, liked to have a good time, he was having a good time. And he said, but what I really need is for my country to be treated fairly. I need for the United States to repay the debts that you owe my people for all the destruction you've done here. I need to be in a position where I can help other Latin American countries win their independence and, and, and be free of this of this terrible presence from the north that you people are exploiting us so badly. I need to have the Panama Canal back in the hands of the Panamanian people. That's what I want. And so leave me alone. Don't, you know, don't, try, to, don't try to bribe me. Um, it was 1981, and in May, Jaime Roldos was assassinated. And Omar was very aware of this. Uh, afterwards, I heard from family members and Marta Roldos, the daughter of Jaime Roldos, married Omar Torrijos' nephew. 
And, and the nephew told Marta, and, and I've heard this from a number of sources, that after that plane crash of rural doses, Torrijos got his family together and he said, I'm probably next, but it's okay because I've done what I came here to do. I've renegotiated the canal. The, 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 the canal will now be in our hands. He just finished negotiating the treaty with, with uh, Jimmy Carter. So I've accomplished what I need to comp accomplish. I'm ready to die if that's what it's going to take. And he had dreams about an airplane crash. In June of that same year, just a couple of months later, uh, he also went down in an airplane crash, which there's no question was um, you know, executed by CIA-sponsored jackals. So that was a pass off of a radio, I think? Yeah, it, it, you know, there's a t tremendous amount of evidence that one of the security guards, one of the, one of Torrijos' security guards, handed him at the last moment as he was getting on the plane a tape recorder, a small tape recorder, that contained a bomb. Well, Panama is a very interesting example because I tried to corrupt Omar Torrijos and bring him around, a great man as far as I was concerned. I, and I was very torn. On the one level, I didn't want to corrupt him. I really respected him for his integrity. On the other level, I, it was my job to corrupt him, and, and I knew that if I didn't, something more dire was likely to happen, which it did. He was assassinated. And that sent Panama into a tailspin. Uh, the, the, the soul was taken out of the country at that point in many re re respects. And eventually, Noriega became president. Noriega had been, we now know, a CIA agent. He'd been paid a lot of money to help fight the Colombia drug cartel. So he was one of our guys. And we figured that once Noriega was in power, that we now could basically reverse the canal treaty that, that Torrijos had struck with Carter uh, and turn that around and also reinstate the School of the Americas, the U.S. military bases in Panama. But Noriega wouldn't do it. He wasn't as much of a puppet as we thought he was. He wasn't willing to reverse those policies. Also, he continued what had begun under Torrijos with negotiations with the Japanese about financing and building a sea level canal. We didn't want to see that happen. If there was going to be a sea level canal, we wanted to finance and build it. And, and Noriega refused to drop out of those negotiations. So he was no longer our, our puppy, our puppet. Um, he wasn't playing the game. And on top of all of that, uh, there's a lot of rumors, and, and I don't have any evidence to back this up. If there was evidence, it was destroyed. But there was a, an island off the coast of Panama con called Contador, which I do know very well. It's still there. It's a resort. And in the 70s, this was a place where deals were struck and where you could take people on private yachts or, or however you wanted to do it. And there was plenty of cocaine, all kinds of drugs, sex, uh, all kinds of illicit activities, and whatever happened on Contador stayed on Contador. People, and, 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 and this was a common knowledge. I, mean, I used it. I took people there. I bribed people on Contador. Everybody was doing it that was involved in South America. Um, and so the, the question has always been asked, we wanted to take out Noriega. Okay, why did we bomb a city? Why did we kill between two and 6,000 innocent civilians? and destroy this part of the city. And I was just in Panama a couple of weeks ago. It was amazing. I traveled around, went down to that part of the city. I talked to people from taxi drivers to government officials about all of this. And, you know, they're still, like, furious at the United States. Why did we do that? We could have taken out Noriega. He was not that difficult to take out. That's our goal. But we didn't have to go in and bomb the section of the city. The best explanation I've heard, the most logical one that I can come up with is that one of the buildings down there belonged to the, the, the military or the national security forces. They didn't, Panama really didn't have an army per se, but it had these national security forces. And this building was totally demolished. There's a lot of eyewitnesses who say once it was demolished, a special unit of the U.S. military went in and made sure that everything was demolished. People saw this. I've talked to people. And the rumor was that within that building there were a lot of photographs of things that went on in Contadora that Noriega, unlike Torrijos, had, had put cameras up. Torrijos was very adamant, nothing would ever leave, and he didn't have any cameras, I'm pretty sure, but that Noriega did. And he had photographs, and he, including very compromising photographs of the, 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 that, the, the, the president, the first President Bush's son, the current President Bush, before he was president, that they had some very compromising photographs of him and a lot of high-up politicians 
and businessmen. Now, again, I have no evidence of this. If, the, if, the, if those photographs existed, they were destroyed because they would have been kept in that building. And it is, it's, it's, it's the only explanation I've ever heard that makes sense to me as to why we went in and destroyed that particular part of the city, which was very vulnerable, a lot of old buildings around that when we knew once we sent in some fire bombs, it was the whole place we had to go. And there were a tremendous number of very poor, innocent people living there, between two and 6,000 died, depending on whose records. The United States admits something like 2,000, Panama even say 6,000. Why would we have done that? Uh, that certainly is an explanation. The precedent for economic hitmen really began back in the early 50s when uh, a president was, a, was elected in Iran, prime minister, democratically elected, Mossadegh, and uh, he was considered to be the hope for democracy in the Middle East and around the world. He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year uh, in 1951. But one of the things that he'd run on and, 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 and began to implement was the idea that foreign oil companies needed to pay the Iranian people a lot more for the oil that they were taking out of Iran. The, the Iranian people should benefit from their own oil. Strange policy. And uh, so once he took office, he began to implement this, including even threats in, in nationalizing uh, foreign oil companies, particularly British oil company, which today is BP. Uh, we didn't like that, of course. But we were afraid to do what we normally were doing in, at that time, which was to send in the military, as you know, we've done in other parts of the world, because Iran was right on the border with Russia. Russia was now the primary enemy of ours, and Russia had nuclear weapons. And we very much feared a nuclear war. So we determined early on that we shouldn't take the normal position and send in the military into Iran. Instead, we sent in one CIA agent, Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy's, Teddy Roosevelt's relative. And Kermit went in with a few million dollars and was very, very effective and efficient. And in a short amount of time, spending a few million dollars, he managed to get Mossadegh overthrown and brought in the Shah of Iran to replace him. So he overthrew this democratically elected president, replaced him with a dictator who always was favorable to oil, and it was extremely effective. So back here in the United States, uh, in Washington, people looked around and said, wow, that was easy and cheap and not messy. And so this established a whole new way of manipulating countries, of, of creating empire. The only problem with Roosevelt was that he was a card-carrying CIA agent, and had he been caught, the ramifications could have been pretty serious. So very quickly at that point, the decision was made to use private consultants to, to, to channel the money through the World Bank or the IMF or one of the other such agencies, to bring in people like me who worked for private companies. So that if we got caught, uh, there would be no governmental ramifications uh, connected with this. And it is interesting to me how this system has continued pretty much the same way for years and years and years, except the economic hitmen have got better and better and better, so we've uh, and more and more subtle. But then we come up with, very recently, what happened in Venezuela. In 1998, Hugo Chavez gets elected president, following a long line of presidents who had been very corrupt and basically destroyed the economy of the country, put, put the largest middle class in Latin America had suddenly become impoverished because they put the country into such debt and people into debt. And Chavez was elected amidst all that. Now, Chavez was not a radical opposed to the United States at that point in time, but after 9-11, Chavez went on the record of saying, I hope that the people of the United States uh, will see what's going on here and understand that there's a lot of anger and resentment in the world. And that was resented in Washington, that he would say that. And so a campaign was launched to make him look like a villain. And then in 2002, a coup was staged, which is no question in my mind, in most other people's minds, that the CIA was behind that coup. But Chavez was very smart, and he had people hidden in the palace and so on, and, and plus he had the people in the, in the streets, took to the streets, and the huge numbers of poor people in Venezuela took to the streets and demanded his return. And so he, was he, he came back into power. And yeah, that, the, the way that that coup was fomented was very reflective of what Kermit Roosevelt had done in Iran, of, of paying people to go out into the streets 
to riot, to protest, to say this Chavez is very unpopular. And you know, you, if you can get a few thousand people to do that in television, and can make it look like it's the whole country, and things start to mushroom. So it was very reminiscent of that, except in the case of Chavez, he was smart enough, and the people were so strongly behind him, and so expecting this to happen, that uh, they overcame it. Which was a phenomenal moment in the history of Latin America. Because regardless of what one thinks of Chavez, and I personally have my problems with his rhetoric and his behavior sometimes, but the fact that he has stood up to the United States, and he's done it primarily demanding that Venezuelan oil be used to help the Venezuelan people. Uh, that has always been his philosophy. And he's been, his success at actually making that happen is, has its ups and downs, but that's always been the philosophy. And also to use some of that money to help other poor people throughout the continent. Uh, the fact that that happened encouraged other countries like Bolivia and Ecuador and Chile and Argentina and Brazil and Uruguay and Nicaragua and Guatemala and so many others to hold democratic elections and vote in presidents who said, our resources must serve our people. So Correa of Ecuador ran on a campaign basically that says, the profits from Ecuadorian oil must help Ecuador's poor people. And Morales ran on a campaign and said, the profits from Bolivia's gas must help Bolivia's poor people. And I don't think that would have been possible had it not been for what Chavez did. So I think history will look back and see this man as being a very key figure in what's really occurring in Latin America today, which is a true nonviolent revolution. There's a democratic revolution happening south of the Rio Grande, and it's very, very significant, more significant than most people in the United States realize. More than 80% of the population of South America in the last democratic elections has voted in the president that said, no more exploitation by the corporatocracy. Our resources must help our people. And it's been nonviolent. It's been democratic. It's been an, it's an amazing process that's going on. I Iraq actually is a perfect example of, of the, the way the whole system works. So we economic hitmen are the first line of defense. We go in and we try to corrupt the governments and, and get them to accept these huge loans, which we then use as leverage to basically own them. If we fail, as I failed in, in Panama with, with Omar Torrijos and in Ecuador with Jaime Roldos, um, men who refuse to be corrupted, then the second line of defense is we send in the jackals. And the jackals either overthrow governments or they assassinate the, the people who won't be corrupted. In the case of both uh, Omar Torrijos and, and Jaime Roldos, they were assassinated because I failed. And once that happens and a new government comes in, and, boy, it's going to toe the line because the new president knows what will happen if he doesn't. In the case of Iraq, uh, both of those things failed. Economic hitmen were not able to get through to Saddam Hussein. We tried very hard. We tried to get him to accept a deal very similar to what the House of Saud had accepted in Saudi Arabia, an amazing deal from our standpoint, but he wouldn't accept it. And so the jackals went in to take him out. They couldn't do it. His security was very good. Um, after all, he had one time worked for the CIA. He'd been hired to assassinate a former president of, of, of Iraq and failed, but he knew the system, and he had these look-alike doubles. It's very hard to assassinate a president unless there's people on the inside helping you. And if the people on the inside don't even know whether they're guarding the real guy or a double, it makes it very difficult for them and very, very risky for them. So we couldn't take him out. So in 91, the first President Bush sent in the troops. And we figured at that point, in time, which, is, which is the last step, if the economic hitmen fail, the jackals fail, then we send in the military. And of course, all these people always know that the military is standing off in the wings to go in if everything else fails. So in 91, we send in the troops and we take out the Iraqi military. So we assume at that point that Saddam Hussein is going to come around. We could have taken him out, of course, at that time. But we didn't want to. He's the kind of strong man we like. He controls his people. He could, we thought he could control the Kurds and keep the Iranians in their border and keep pumping oil for us. And that once we took out his military, now he's going to come around. So the economic hitmen go back in in the 90s without success. If they'd had success, he'd still be running the country. We'd be selling him all the fighter jets he wants and everything else he wants. 
but they couldn't, they, they, they didn't have success. The jackals couldn't take him out again, so we sent the military in once again, and this time we did the complete job and took him out and in the process created for ourselves some very, very lucrative construction uh, deals. We had to reconstruct a company, a country that we essentially destroyed, which is a pretty good deal if you own construction companies, big ones. So that those are really, you know, Iraq shows the three stages. The economic hitmen failed there, the jackals failed there, and as a final um, measure, the military goes in. Destabilization thing is a good well, That's what I meant. Okay, but but that, was a good it is a good example. So is the Middle East. East. So Southern. Well, yeah, you know, chaos, mayhem, destabilization are, are the friends of exploitation. And so if you can have internal problems in a country, then, you, then, then it's ripe for exploitation. You know, it's the old divide and conquer. So, for example, in the Middle East, the fact that Sunnis and Shiites and, and Israelis all are at each other's throats works to the advantage of oil companies because the divide and conquer, if they all came together and, fo and found the common enemy, which is the exploiting people, then the oil companies wouldn't have the chance. But as long as they can keep it destabilized. And in South America, it's, it's fascinating how we've seen that um, throughout the history of Latin America, uh, the indigenous people in the military have usually been opposed ever since the time of the conquest. But in the recent elections in places like Ecuador and Venezuela and, and Bolivia, these two groups have come together. They've united. And as a result, now you have this amazing revolution that's going on in South America, which is not pleasing to uh, U.S. corporatocracy. And we, you know, we really blew it there in, if, from that standpoint in that the destabilization is no longer happening. These diverse groups have come together to, because they've realized it's to their self-interest to, to, to stick together, to fight the common enemy, which is the corporatocracy, which is us, really. And Africa is an amazing example. Because who's ever heard of Africa? I mean, we hear the name Africa, but who knows anything about Africa? What do we know about coltan in the Congo? What do we really know about diamonds in so many of these countries? What do we really know about oil in the Sudan? We hear these things, but we don't really know much. What we like to say, the American people like to say, the American press likes to say, oh, it's those corrupt leaders. We don't ask who corrupted them. Leaders are not corrupt. They are corrupted. Somebody does it. And they say, when we say, oh, you know, tribal warfare, well, who's creating the tribal warfare? It's been to the advantage of the British, the French, the Dutch, the Germans, whoever happened to be there, now us, to foster this kind of instability, this antagonism, the antagonism between Muslims and Christians and Jews. Uh, this goes on and on. And Africa is, I think Africa is truly the canary in the cave, in, in the mine. And it's, it's a dying canary, you know? It's terribly dying, and we don't even look. We don't know. And another problem with Africa is that the people in our own country whose heritage is African, the, the, the African Americans, for the most part, don't even know where they were from. They don't know what language their ancestors spoke. So it's hard for them to really relate. Unlike Latin America, for example, you, you, we can't really do something in Venezuela or Colombia or Bolivia without people in this country taking note because a lot of those people are from there. We got a lot of people here in this country from Venezuela and Colombia and Bolivia and so on. And, and, and they're interested. And they know where they're from and they can read the local papers. They can read Spanish. But in Africa, our African heritage people don't even know where they're from and they don't read those papers. And, and so there's been this, this huge mask that's been thrown over Africa. I mean, it truly is a dark continent from the f point of view of we don't let light in. The media doesn't understand what's going on. It doesn't want to. And the corporatocracy surely don't want us to understand. I mean, the, the, you know, the corporations do everything they can to, form, form, uh, to foment turmoil, mayhem, instability, chaos there, and to keep the information from reaching the American public, from even reaching the press, because that serves their interests best. Forget about chads, forget about stolen, well don't forget about them, but put them aside for a moment and just deal with the bigger issue, which is the American public really doesn't know what we're voting for. And we're seeing in the presidential campaigns, you know, that, that there's 
there's, a, there's an ignorance or there's an avoidance of what's really going on. We don't really talk about the causes behind the immigration problem. We talk about the band-aids to cure it. Should we build a wall? Should we make stricter laws? Should we uh, invite these people to become citizens? But the real issue is the fact that we've destroyed the economies in their country, in their countries through our free trade agreements that have benefited the big corporations hugely but have made everybody else suffer. The workers in the United States, the workers in Guatemala and Mexico and throughout Central America and many parts of South America are suffering terribly. Not one of them wants to be here. I speak Spanish, I live in Florida, I go out and I talk to the Guatemalans who are taking care of everybody's lawns and doing a lot of the other menial work. They don't want to be here. They're not getting rich here. They're sending all their money home. They want to be back in Guatemala or Mexico or Honduras or El Salvador, wherever they're from. These are beautiful countries. They want to be there. There's no work there and there's no work there because of the laws that we've passed because of the IMF, because of the World Bank, because of what the corporatocracy is doing to exploit these countries. So if we really want to deal with the immigration problem, that's what we must do, is help these countries get back on their feet and, and open their doors to their own people to have jobs there. But our presidential candidates aren't addressing that. Although, you know, I, 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 at, at least at, back in the 70s, and I'm, I'm writing about this now in, in the book I'm working on now, that I was called into Washington to the Army and Navy Club, met with a lot of retired um, uh, generals and, and admirals to talk about a job that was going on in, in the Indian Ocean. And I found that, and, and I found this to be the case, that the, at the top echelons of the military, they don't want to go to war. You know, they know. They know that that's just going to create more problems. Mean, they know that if you want to create terrorism, you know, send in the army. Uh, the, the lower echelons are, are uneducated about that, don't understand it, but the highest echelons, I think in general the military doesn't want to go to war. The politicians want to go to war. The corporations want to go to war. Because every corporation stands to, or many corporations stand to make a tremendous amount of money out of war. So you and I may think that Vietnam was a failure and that Iraq is a failure. But if you own a big industry that, that has any relationship whatsoever to the war machine, and that includes insurance companies and banks and includes companies we don't usually think of as being part of the military industrial complex, if you happen to be the CEO or major owner of any of those corporations, you think that uh, Vietnam was a huge success and so is Iraq. How about if we use what just happened in Colombia between Colombia and Ecuador, you know, oh, yes, as an example? Sure, that's great. Okay. And I was in Nicaragua at the time, so I got an interesting perspective, which oh, was very different from the U.S. I'm sure. press here. As a fact, I was supposed to be meeting with um, Ortega, uh, but he had to fly out the morning I was supposed to meet with him to go to Santo Domingo early for this meeting that was held with all the heads of states of Latin America, basically condemned Uribe of Colombia. But if we look at the situation in Colombia, which is, uh, which is, uh, let me think, let me just think of the word here. Uh, if we look at the situation in Colombia, which is symbolic of so many, you go back to the time when I was in Colombia in the 70s, and, and I was there to get huge World Bank and Inter-American Development Bank loans for Colombia to build infrastructure project using U.S. corporations to do it. Particularly, we were building big hydroelectric dams, transmission lines, pipelines, those sorts of things. And the poor people of Colombia objected very, very strongly. The the campesinos, the majority of the people. For example, we would dam up rivers to create hydroelectric projects and destroy vast amounts of farmlands, destroy towns. And then we would build transmission lines from these across uh, llanos and jungles and through people's backyards and these big transmission towers. But the people who lived in those areas didn't get any electricity. They got absolutely no benefits. And they, were, they were outraged and so they formed what we would call guerrilla groups, sort of like the Boston Minutemen. And it was, it was fascinating that my company, Charles T. Main, we had offices in Barranquilla and in Bogota, Colombia. We were designing these huge projects. We were not allowed to send any U.S. citizens, engineers, to the project site, only Colombians, because it was too dangerous. The guerrillas, as we call them, would come down and attack the construction camps. And they would send the workers down the river in canoes. They didn't hurt them, but they scared them. And this went on and on. And meanwhile, the oil exploration starting in other parts of Colombia, and similar things are happening there. The campesinos are very strongly objecting to oil. 
and the guerrillas would come in. And originally they were supported financially by Russia and China to a certain degree and to a certain degree by Cuba. And of course we then painted them as being communists. And most of them didn't care at all about the philosophy. They just simply wanted to have their lands. These were desperate people. Their lands were being destroyed. Their families were starving. And they wanted to get us out of there. And they wanted not to have this happen anymore. But we accused them of being communists. Well, as, as, as communist funds began to dry up, as things happened in Russia and China and Cuba, that, that funds began to dry up, they, they turned to extortion, blackmail, kidnapping, and drugs as a way of financing themselves. And over time, that became much more a part of their business. It was one of their few ways of financing themselves. You know, we all think detente is such a great thing, the, the peace between the Soviet Union and the United States. But there's a, there's a dark side to that, too. There was a balance when the Soviet Union was there. If the United States put too much pressure on our country to bend to our will, the country would sort of slip off toward Russia, and then we would, we would back off the position. Once the Soviet Union was gone, uh, there was nobody for anybody to turn to, except terrorism, in essence. And so today we have a situation, for example, in Colombia, where you have these organizations like FARC that to a large degree are financed through drugs and extortion and other illegal activities, but their basis is in defense of the people to a very large degree. And recently, I was in Nicaragua at the time, uh, Colombia, President Uribe, sent troops into Ecuador to take out the leader of FARC, who was the, the, that particular leader, who actually, according to my sources, was in Ecuador to negotiate a peace settlement and arrange for a hostage exchange. exchange. He and about 20 other people of his group were all killed by the Colombian president. And of course, Correa, the president of Ecuador, objected very, very strongly. And Hugo Chavez joined in with Correa. And there was a huge uh, conflict about this. And, and all of the presidents of South America met in Santo Domingo. And they all condemned Uribe. But the United States defended him, including all three presidential candidates, Clinton, Obama, and McCain, all came to Colombia's defense, which was absurd. One of the things that was happening there is Colombia is the largest recipient in the, in the, in the hemisphere, one of the largest in the world, of, of U.S. military foreign aid to fight these FARC people. Uribe doesn't want peace with FARC because then his funds dry up. And really what that money is used for more than anything else is to defend our oil companies in Colombia and the construction of pipelines. So we use this excuse, whether it's called communism back in the old days, the Red Scare, or whether it's called Al-Qaeda or terrorism or whatever it is, we find these enemies and in fact we create these enemies. And this gives us a foothold into the country so we can have our military in there and we can use them to defend our oil companies, which in the case of Colombia and Ecuador and throughout so much of Latin America are terribly, terribly exploitative and destroy environments, destroy people. The, the largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the world today is being brought on behalf of 30,000 Ecuadorian Amazonian people against Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron, so today it's against Chevron, but for activities conducted by Texaco throughout the years of dumping what's estimated to be more than 18 times more than what the Exxon Valdez dumped into the coast of Alaska. In the case of, in the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. That's unbelievable. It is. It's so blind because they, they're just killing themselves in the end. Well, they make a hell of a lot of money in the process. Right. And none of these executives expect to be, you know, to hold their job for more than a few years anyway. So right. make a killing while you're there. So in 1971, the United States was very much in debt as we are today, and foreign companies started. Wait, let me set that over again. Okay. So in 1971, the United States was very deeply in debt as it is today, and we were on the gold standard. And so other countries began to call in the debt in gold. They didn't want dollars; they wanted gold. We couldn't pay it, and so Nixon and his buddies 
uh, took us off the gold standard. And of course the argument at the time was made that there's no economic reason to be on a gold standard, but the truth of the matter is we couldn't pay. We were bankrupt. We couldn't pay in gold. So we simply went off the gold standard and said, here, we'll pay you in dollars, but we don't need to back it up with gold. But that then threatened to undermine the dollar as the world currency because it put it in huge question. So in 1973, um, when the OPEC oil embargo hit, it created an ideal opportunity to do something that was even better than the gold standard. And at that point, um, some of the treasury people came to me and other economic hitmen and said, listen, you know, we can't allow OPEC to hold us up anymore. We can't allow them to, put, to blackmail us. You've got to come up with a scheme so this can't happen again. Well, the scheme that we came up with, and this is the short version, is that uh, the, the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia, we, we knew we had to do it through the House of Saud because they were corrupt, corruptible and they had more oil than anybody else. The House of Saud agreed to return almost all the money that they made selling petroleum to the world to the United States and invested in U.S. government securities. The interest from that security, from those securities, would be used to finance the westernization of Saudi Arabia so that the Treasury Department would have that interest to hire U.S. corporations to build power plants, desalinization plants, huge cities. And the House of Saud also agreed to keep the oil prices within limits acceptable to our oil companies and, most importantly perhaps, never ever to sell oil for anything other than dollars. So suddenly, in a couple of years, the dollar had moved from being on the gold standard to just being free-floating, basically, to now developing its own standard, the oil standard, which in many respects was much more powerful than the gold standard because, after all, Oil has inherently more value in, in, in the modern world than gold does. Um, and so today we've been struggling all these years with this same situation where we're on the oil standard. And now we're once again at this position where we have hold tremendous amounts of debt. We're a huge debtor nation, the largest debtor nation in the world in the United States. And other countries are beginning to say, but we want our debt in something other than dollars because we don't like the dollar, we don't trust it. So Saddam Hussein threatened to go onto what he called an oil burst, where, oil exchange, where he would sell oil for something other than dollars, yen or euros or some other currency. And that's one reason that we went after him. That's just one more reason. Um, and today, interestingly enough, Iran is doing the same thing. Iran is offering to sell oil. In fact, they say they want to sell oil not for dollars ever. They want to sell it for other currencies. This is a huge threat to us. It's, I think it's the primary reason why we're making threats as if we're going to attack Iran. I don't think it has nearly as much to do with nuclear energy as we like to think it does. It has to do with oil and the oil bursts. Uh, because if Iran, in fact, does sell oil for something other than the dollar, it puts the dollar in a very weak position. And if someone wants to bankrupt us, uh, they, someone like China or Japan or one of the other big holders of our debt, they can call in our debt in euros or in something else. But they can only do that if they can buy oil in that other currency, because oil is the true currency that's out there today. Well, oil is the ideal fuel for the corporatocracy. And so when you have a resource like that, you can really control it. And of course, the corporatocracy likes that. Also, everything downstream, you have to have gas stations, you have to have pipelines, you have to have all these things. And that's a, that's a reason why biofuels, ethanol, things like that are are acceptable to them, that more acceptable to, to Washington, to the corporatocracy, than, for example, solar, which you, you don't have that kind of control over. Um, so oil is, is really a, a, it's a political football. It's, it, it, it is a tr tremendous convenience for those who want to control. And it, and it is the backing of our currency today. So the dollar is backed by oil. So it makes it very hard to, th to talk about getting off oil from a political standpoint. You know, if every tile, if every tile on every roof was a solar panel, which is te te technologically possible, um, think of what that would do. Now, you know, people know energy, know that there's, there's peak times of using fuel and you can't, you know, it's hard to use solar at night, although it's definitely not impossible. We, we put solar units out for some of the communities in the Amazon and they have big batteries that they 
put it into, and they, they run off solar all night long. You, you can do that, even though it seems that in this country, in the United States, it's, it's almost like a myth that you can't do that, but you can do it. Um, so, but if, if we think in terms of really trying hard to use what's there uh, and to use it in an efficient way, you know, the concept of huge solar stations out in the Mojave Desert or someplace, that's, that, that to me is wrong because once again, it's feeding into the hands of central control. And not only that, but who knows what that would do for climate. If you take all that solar energy that would have gone into the earth otherwise, out of the earth, and instead put it into electricity, it's going to have some impact. But where we've got roofs, where the solar is just hitting the roofs anyway, what an efficient use. So we certainly need to look more and more and more at this whole thing of, of energy. And we, we know there's, there's other technologies that are out there that we haven't really even explored. Uh, with any sort of, uh, any, you know, any sort of seriousness, because they don't fit within the context of the politics of the game. And you know, I think something else is very important here, and that is that we must, at some point, come to grips with the fact that we've got to cut back on everything, whether we're talking about energy consumption, or clothes, or the size of our houses. We in the developed world, we who live in these very affluent societies like the United States must cut back because there are limitations on this planet. There's no question about it. And we're fast appro approaching those limitations. So we must cut back. We must control population to some degree and we must control the per capita expenditure uh, on economic goods, on materialistic goods. We must cut back. We, can't, we cannot expect technology to solve these problems entirely. We have to also solve them by spirituality, by realizing, for lack of a better word, spirituality, by recognizing that uh, happiness doesn't come through consuming more and more energy, consuming more and more pro pro products. It comes from something much deeper, something much more basic, that feeling of oneness, that bliss, that connection with all the plants and animals and elements and other people. We have a great deal of power over these corporations. And so we're at this amazing time in history where there's a world empire. And I think for the first time, we don't want to overthrow it. We don't want to get rid of it. We want to change it. We want to do something that's never been done in history before. We want to break an old pattern because if this empire collapses, then history tells us that there'll probably be some wars, economic or military wars, and eventually some new empire will emerge. We don't want that. What we'd rather do is transform this empire, make it into a true model of a world where we can live sustainably, environmentally sustainably, in a socially just world, in a peaceful world. And so I think we have this opportunity now to tell those corporatocracy people, okay, go ahead, maximize profits, but only do so within the context of always heading toward creating an environmentally sustainable, a socially just, and a peaceful world for everyone on the planet. Because we know that our world won't be stable and just and sustainable unless the entire planet is. We live in a very, very small community. That's the other thing that's grown out of this empire. Is this, it's the world community has shrunk tremendously. When I was an economic hitman in the 70s, several times I spent three, four days trying to make a phone call from Jakarta, Indonesia to Boston, Massachusetts. Today you can call any place on the planet instantaneously. You can go in the deepest part of the Amazon and through satellite phones. You can send a whole book by email almost instantaneously from any place on this planet. We are a very, very small world. And I have a grandson, he's about six months old now. I'm very aware of the fact that my grandson cannot possibly hope to inherit a sustainable, peaceful, stable, socially just world unless every child today growing up in Ethiopia, in Indonesia, in Bolivia, in Palestine, in Israel also has that same expectation. So here we are at this amazing time in history, small world ruled by the emperor, which is a corporatocracy, which is it's a, it's a corporate ruling, it's a, it's a commercial, it's an economic thing, it's not a military thing, and these corporations are very, very vulnerable. We can turn them around, and we must turn them around.
Where does the desire to keep making more come from? Where yeah. does greed come from? Sure. Where does well, I, you know, I think that um, greed, in a way, is our measure of success. So, if I'm a corporate executive and I'm making five million dollars a year, and the, the the guy in charge of my rival company is making six million, I feel I got to do better. I got to surpass him. That's my measure of success. If I'm an athlete. Same sort of thing. The athletes are all vying with each other to see who makes the most money because that's how we measure our success in general. And of course, it's a false measure of success because we all know really happiness is the success. What kind of a life do we lead? How do we relate to our families? How do we relate to the world? And if in the process of making this extra million dollars as a corporate executive or a movie star or an athlete or whatever, we're also creating a bigger gap between us and the people uh, in Indonesia who are making the shoes that we wear as an athlete or as a corporate executive or the clothes that we wear as a movie star, then in the long run we're making this a much less stable world, a much more dangerous world for ourselves and our progeny. And so we must turn this thing around and really look at what, what, what is it that we value. It, it really isn't money. And you know, working with CEOs and, and people in top management uh, for many, many years as I've had, and including I still continue to. I, I, I give talks to big corporations and their executives. I just came back recently from, from giving one. Um, I'm very struck by the fact that I've never met an evil CEO. They may exist, but I haven't met any. I've never met one that wants to see Florida sink beneath the ocean. I've never met one that wants to see the ozone layer destroyed or wants to see more poverty and misery in the world. What I need is men and women who have been taught in business schools, who have been taught within their corporate cultures, that they must maximize profits regardless of the costs, the social and environmental costs. But they don't really want to do that. And they're really not buying into this idea that they've got to make an extra million dollars to compete with the, the guy in the next post. That's really not what they're about, as far as I can see. They do it because that is their measure of success. It's the same reason that when it starts when we're in school, you know, I mean, the, the kid sitting next to us gets an A and we're getting a B and there's pressure put, in, put on us to do better than them or be, excel in a sport for whatever reason. With this constant thing of this is how we measure ourselves. We really need to turn that around. You know, it would be such a different world if the Fortune 500 were not the wealthiest 500 people or the wealthiest 500 companies, but instead were those that do the most to make a better world for our children. Just think if Randy Hayes, who founded Rainforest Action Network, was in the Fortune 500, not because of money he makes, but, but because of what he does. Just think, you know, what, what, if, what if people like that were Time Magazine's Man of the Year? This is the direction we must move in. And you and I can create that. It, it's in our hands to do that. And I also think we need to understand that almost every executive out there is looking for that too. Obviously they love their grandchildren. They don't want to see the entire world destroyed. Well, it's our, it's our form of adulation. So, you know, these, how, do we, how do we honor corporate executives? We honor them by making, you know, they think they're being honored when they get more pay, when they get bigger bonuses, when their stock increases, because that's the system that we're buying into that says, that's the measure of success. How much money do you have? How big is your house? How, how large is your yacht? How many private jets do you have? I mean, we the people make a big point of that. We watch television shows about this. We watch movies about it. And we say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I had a big yacht like that and a huge mansion like 15 houses like that? So, you know, we make it, we, we put these people in this position. Mm. It strikes me as, as amazing that we have reached a point in time where we even talk about the need to be sustainable. Because throughout history, everybody's always been sustainable. I spend a lot of time with indigenous people in places like the Amazon. They don't do anything that isn't sustainable. You just don't do it. If it isn't sustainable, it's not even possible or conceivable that you would do it. And so now here we are at a time where we've, we've come through several hundred years of history doing non-sustainable things. And we're all sitting around now, big corporations are getting together for conferences on sustainability. Should we become sustainable? Can we become sustainable? Well, the obvious answer is, if we don't become sustainable, by definition, <laughs> we're not here any longer at some point. So 
Uh, we, we really must take into account the, the, the totality. This isn't just a human experience on this planet. This is a total experience. And we know we can't survive without plants and animals. We know we can't survive without the earth. We know we can't survive without the, the, the four elements, you know? And so when are we going to really start taking that into account and saying, that's what it is to be successful? Success depends on how well we relate to everything around us, not just other human beings, but all the things around us. That is success, and then we ought to really be honoring the people that take that into account. These ought to be our Fortune 500 people and, and the people who win all the awards and get on the covers of all the magazines, those who lead us in a direction towards sustainability. And in that same context, we can't take out the, the socially just aspect of it. You know, they, again, it goes together. We can't treat other human beings in, uh, in unjust ways and expect to continue, and expect to be sustainable. That, that doesn't last for very long. It, under the old systems, where you had small pockets of population, and sometimes they went to war with each other, and that, that goes up to the time of World War II. You could, you could still say that's part of the old system. Then perhaps, but today we're so interlocked, we are all living so closely together, that we all have to take care of each other. Just like in a small community, in a tribe or in a small town in New England where you have uh, town meetings, everybody knows that you got to take care of the whole community or you're going to have serious problems. And now we have to see that the whole world is the community. And we must all take care of each other that way. And it's not just a community of human beings. It's a community of plants and animals and elements. And we really need to understand that. That's what's going to bring us joy, too, and pleasure. That's what's missing in our lives right now. We can call it spirituality. We can go back to the roots of religion. We can go wherever we want with this. But the fact of the matter is, joy comes from that bliss of connectedness. In indigenous cultures, you often hear words that we interpret as bliss, as ecstasy. But what do they really mean? They mean the feeling of connection the feeling of connection with everything. And another way to look at it is to say that's our, that's our connection with the divine. That's our God spirit. That's that side of ourselves that really feels it. And you can feel it deep inside you. It's this amazing, wonderful feeling. And you know it when you get it. You don't get it from money. You get it from connection. Each one of us is presented frequently by fate. Coincidences by things that happen in our life that seem random. And they come along all the time. What's really important is how we choose to react to them, what we do with those coincidences. And the decisions we make each time we're confronted by one of these makes all the difference as to where we go from here. Uh, for example, you know, uh, I was graduated from college at the time of the Vietnam draft. You could call that a coincidence. I chose to go in the Peace Corps, and that made a huge difference to me. I learned a great deal about other countries. Um, if I had chosen to go to jail, I would have had a very different experience. Or if I had chosen to join the Army and go to Vietnam, or if I had chosen to move to Canada. All of those are the decisions we make based on that on one coincidence, that particular coincidence. And I think it's actually very important that we, we be conscious of that when these coincidences present themselves. And it could be a hardship. Suddenly, you've gone bankrupt. Okay, that may not exactly be a coincidence, but that's a, it's an event. You're, you're bankrupt. Well, what are you going to do with that? Where are you going to go with that? And to realize that the decision you make at this point in your life is going to have a huge effect on you. Uh, my daughter. Uh, recently gave me a grandson, but before the grandson arrived, she knew she's going to have a baby, and she's got to buy cribs, and she's got to buy clothes, and she's got to look at what kinds of diapers to use, and all these kinds of things. She had all, every point along that line, made the decision that she wanted to do the thing that was most environmentally and socially responsible, because she saw it as an investment in her child's future. And she couldn't always find good alternatives. In some of these areas, like car seats, for example, it's really hard to find ones that aren't made in China or someplace. But to be aware that you're do doing everything you can and you're, you're going to make every attempt, and, and, and not to see this as a sacrifice, 
but to see it as an investment in your child's future. By doing the right thing now from an environmental and social standpoint, we are taking care of our children, our grandchildren, all the future generations. I think it's so important that we understand that. And sometimes we can't make that investment. Sometimes we just can't afford to make an investment even though we know it would be a good investment. At times like that, we just have to do our best, but realize that we're foregoing an investment and commit ourselves to making that investment the next time it's possible for us to do so. From a practical standpoint, what can we do to make this a better world for ourselves and future generations? It's, that, that's the essential question right now. And I think we all know a lot of the basic things we can do. You know, we should never buy anything that's made in a sweatshop, that's made by slaves, that's made by people that suffer, that aren't, that aren't given good health insurance, that aren't taken care of, and, and, and their families aren't taken care of. We just shouldn't buy anything that's made by people like that. We know that. Uh, we shouldn't drink water that comes out of plastic bottles and brought to us from Fiji or someplace way off like that where we're exploiting another country's water supply. Um, you know, we shouldn't waste fuels. We shouldn't be inefficient in that. We shouldn't build houses that are way too big uh, to, to, to satisfy any, any common sense within us. There's so many things like that that we, that we all know. We shouldn't be putting chemicals in our foods and, and so on and so forth. But I think beyond all of that, if you, if you really come right down to it, those are all Band-Aids. And we need Band-Aids badly because we're hemorrhaging. But beyond all that, I think we all, each one of us, needs to look deep inside of ourselves. Every, every one of us has passion. And every one of us has talent. Now, I'm a writer, that's my passion, and I hope I have some talent as a writer also. But regardless of whether you're a filmmaker, a musician, a carpenter, a plumber, a teacher, a housewife, whatever you are, you've got passion and you have talent. And if every one of us can go deep into our passions, can realize our passions, using our talents to do that, but always have as a guiding point that we will work to creating an environmentally sustainable, socially just, and peaceful world, then we will get there. We will all get there, if that's the destination that every one of us has. We can come from many different directions. I'm often struck by how fortunate we are that during the time of the American Revolution, Tom Paine didn't try to lead armies. And George Washington didn't write pamphlets. Paine followed his passion. He was a writer. He had talent. And Washington followed his passions and talents as a leader of men. And Benjamin Franklin didn't do either thing. He, he was an old man. He went off to, off to France and he convinced the French to become our allies. All of that was essential. And it was all aimed at one goal. But they all came from very different directions. And I think this is an important time to realize how we can do that. Uh, students sometimes in business schools where I'm speaking come up to me and say, you know, well, should I go to work for the big corporation and try to change things from inside? Or do I need to be outside and demonstrate against the corporations? And I say, you know, that depends on you. We need people in both places. What's your passion? Where can you do it best? If you go to work for a big corporation, will, will you be corrupted by it? Or will you really try to change it, learn from it and change it? And these are questions we need to ask ourselves. But if every one of us really looks inside, we're not going to be successful if we don't follow our passions and use our talents to do it. And we've all got a path that we can go along, and there can be lots and lots and lots of different paths, but let's all aim toward that one goal of creating a, an environmentally sustainable, socially just and peaceful world. And when we do that, we'll get there.